This is a short clip from my parent membership group on Subscribestar. That's where I post my most practical and comprehensive videos. Once a month, I address common questions in the form of a topic video, and I also run live monthly Q&As where parents can submit a question and briefly talk through their situation with me. Please check out my Subscribestar to learn more about the different subscription levels. Now here's the video. So before I jump into the video, I want to say first that a completely wide and varied range of emotional responses that parents have to their child's gender questioning is completely normal. It's something that we see all the time, and it's very understandable because, as I've talked about so many times, all of the normal structures that you might rely on if your child is struggling with a mental health issue in society, like doctors and therapists and even friends in the school, have kind of betrayed the trust of parents. And so that means you're kind of flailing around in a very unusual, disorienting situation, being treated like the bad guy, or feeling really confused about what's happening to your family. So I just want to normalize if you hear um, your experience in some of the examples I share today or in some of the descriptions I give, I want you to know that this is not in any way a criticism. This is just an observation of the very normal responses that parents can have when they're going through this experience with their kid. Um, and if you hear anything that resonates with you here, Again, always check it against your instinct and against what you believe to be best for your kid and take what you need and leave what you don't. So um, there's no hard and fast rules for any of these things. As I often share with parents, we are learning together as we go because this is a new uh, kind of dynamic, at least in my lifetime working as a clinician. I did not work through you know, the disorder, the I, multiple personality disorders epidemic. I didn't live through the lobotomies. I mean, I think this is a real medical scandal that's very disorienting. So we're learning together as we go. Um, and I want to also share with you guys before I, I start, um, what is the kind of why behind this video? I.e., like, if you watch this video and put into practice some of the ideas that resonate with you, what is the point of doing that? Why would you? And I think a lot of parents come to these videos and, of course, have joined this membership group in general because they're like, I want to help my kid desist, which is a completely laudable goal. And that may be one of the outcomes of kind of breaking up these unhealthy patterns or working on these dynamics together. But I think more importantly, I really want to invite parents to do a couple of the following things. So I think if you follow some of the strategies here, you might break up like a tension and false atmosphere that exists in your home. There's a lot of this like walking on eggshells. This is something we can't talk about. And, you know, nobody goes from that to like, oh, my kid's totally open with me. And now they want to talk about everything. I, I don't want to paint some kind of picture of like a utopia waiting on the other end of this video. But when you've been like holding your tongue for years and you don't feel like you can say what you want to say, that is not healthy for you and it's not healthy for your family. So breaking up that tension, creating kind of more of a long-term stability rather than just constantly putting out fires right now because I know that's the emotional tone that a lot of people are experiencing. Um, and, and just again, you know, being able to lift a weight off your chest and say what you need to say or find the authority that you have maybe lost with your child. There are, these are really important kind of personal growth uh, types of things that can come out of really leaning into this experience and figuring out how to break up these patterns. And sometimes you being honest about what you really think is in conflict with the idea of your child desisting. So as you guys know, I, I encourage a lot of restraint at times too, which we're going to touch on this depending on where you're at, like if you need to restrain and pull back or whatever. But generally speaking, 
If you feel like you've been living a lie for four years and you're getting totally exhausted and you don't think you have permission to just say what you really think, I just think that is so soul crushing and destructive that some of the recommendations in this video are really about how do we help you guys, the parents, survive this. And if you are falling apart, there's no strategy I can give you that you can deliver with a kind of like calm, loving stoicism that is kind of required in this experience. So I want to just start by saying the reasons that you may want to engage with these ideas is partially for yourself, not just for your child. So you may need to lean in with more structure if... You are a highly conflict avoidant person. So I think Lisa Duval did a really good job of flushing this out when we interviewed her on our podcast. She's a member here. She often comes to our Q&As. She is a mom of an ROGD kid. And um, she talked in that episode about her clinical work. She's also a therapist. Uh, and some of the patterns she's observed in families who love their kids dearly, but perhaps due to their own backgrounds or their own experience in childhood, are inclined to try and protect their kids from all kinds of emotional harm. And so that can create a pattern where you are conflict avoidant with your child and end up kind of trying to take pain away from them by complying and kind of capitulating to all of their requests. This could also be about thinking that they're too fragile to tolerate your boundary. And I'm going to talk a little bit about like mental health issues and suicidality and trauma in just a couple of minutes. But if you'll just bear with me, if you tend to think that, you know, my child just, they're too fragile, they could not handle it if I said no, or if I um, asserted what I think is right, or if I denied their request, you may need to lean in with that structure. Um, these are parents who tend to be not in any way like neglectful in terms of those bomb rind parenting styles. It's not like you're um, being permissive because you don't really have a lot of investment. These are parents who are staying up hours and hours and hours a night researching gender dysphoria and really reasonably being very nervous about it, but are too afraid or don't know how to kind of set the boundaries at home or create the structure at home. And this could also look like kind of waffling back and forth. So these are parents who might be trying really hard to use the pronouns one day, but like failing completely and then starting to micromanage on other things, like, you know, finding ways to kind of oscillate back and forth between feeling like helpless and not knowing what to do. And so this is... Um, really hard to follow through with like, you know, these are parents who have a hard time following through if you set a rule or you try to create some kind of structure. And what this leads to, I think, is when kids have a huge amount of power in the family dynamic and an oversized amount of power within the, the structure of the family. And I was consulting with a, a, a lovely mom recently, and what she described was that it was like her child was the sun and everybody in the family were like planets revolving around her child and you know we as we were talking we kind of came to realize that this kid is calling all the shots and every decision that parents make is really about trying to appease this kid who maybe has tantrums who's maybe getting really aggressive who's maybe just asserting their power in a way that dismisses the needs of everybody else in the family and I remember something Stella said in the podcast once. And she said, you know, every single member of the family's needs matter. It is not just about one person. And in, in psychology and psychiatry, especially in family therapy, we talk about the identified patient, which is the person who's been identified as the problem person and is brought to therapy. And then what you realize is there's a whole dynamic revolving uh, around this particular problem that is really maybe actually about other things too. So if you feel like your child is calling all the shots and everything you do is to try to calm them and appease them, that may be part of what's going on here. Um, I would also say 
if you feel as though you have a lot of secret opinions and thoughts that you can't share because you don't know if your kid is going to have a tantrum or blow up, um, that might mean there's some room here for leaning in with structure and communication. It just kind of came to my mind too that a lot of kids who are on the autism spectrum have outsized emotional reactions to things. And so it can be really challenging to um, create structure and follow through with it. And there may be times where some negotiation and some flexibility is required, but if you kind of feel like you've been held hostage in your house by your child, um, that would be something just worth examining and worth thinking about. And you know, maybe take that to like a parent group that you're in and think through it with somebody that you trust or with your spouse um, or a dear friend who is your confidant here. Like this is really worth thinking about. Um, also, if there's something kind of pressing on your conscience, like um, this came up in our Q&A recently, our, our Q&A this past weekend, parents whose kids are adults and they're in college or going off to college and they realize that they are starting a medical process even though the parent maybe thought that they were on a different track or that maybe even desisting and that's a shocking shocking revelation um but then you might find yourself in this kind of fork in the road where you're like I have one last shot to say what's in my heart or to say what's on my mind that I need to express to this kid and this this does often happen like right before a kid goes off to college now I've often advised against kind of like last ditch efforts of bombarding the kid with things. Um, and I still think if, if our goal is getting the kid to loosen up their fixation on gender, I still think it's better to avoid that last ditch effort. But I also recognize, again, I'm learning this over time, the parents are really thrown under the bus in these situations. And so if you need to say or do something to clear your conscience and to feel okay with yourself, I totally respect that need and you just may need to do that. And, and I've heard parents say, even if this risks our kid getting really angry and like distancing themselves a lot, I feel like I have to say this. And I do think the risk of estrangement is there. And, you know, as a person who doesn't have skin in the game personally, I don't have a kid who's going through this, I would say the risk of estrangement is the greatest risk. And I, I, I feel very sure that that's my stance as a clinician, but I'm not the parent. And so if you as a parent feel like this is a hill I'm willing to die on, even if it really disrupts my relationship with my kid just because I have to know I tried, I understand that too. So I just want to say, you know, there's no formula for how to survive this. And if your conscience is really calling you to say something, then you may need to say something. Um, and then lastly, um, you may need to lean in with structure if you look at the situation and you realize, wow, I've actually been completely joining my child in their fantasy, or I've colluded with my child in their identity confusion. And if this is you, it's just important to take an honest evaluation of that action and whether that lines up with your instinct. If that lines up with your instinct and you're like, no, I'm doing this, this affirmation 100% because I believe in it and I really think this is working for my child and I stand by it, that's fine. But if you feel like you've been coerced into it, pressured into it, you've had your arm twisted, or you did it purely out of terror because your child was mentally unstable, then I want you to kind of tune in and figure out, okay, as the parent who knows this kid well, in the long run, what would be a positive outcome for this kid? And are we on that path now? Like you really have to evaluate why you did the decisions that you did or made the decisions that you did and whether or not that aligns with what you sense in your gut. What do you think is best for your kid? 
and, and this is where I want to just touch on the trauma of seeing your child go through really severe mental health issues. So sometimes, especially a lot of these COVID kids, man, they deteriorated under lockdown circumstances. And so you had a kid who was like happy and pretty functional and doing well in life to like a kid you barely recognize who's all of a sudden struggling with self-harm and like making suicidal statements or even having suicide attempts. And when you are in that place, you are in crisis management. And it is completely understandable to be in crisis mode and to make some decisions that in hindsight, you're like, well, I don't know if that's taking us in a good direction. But I think once you have gotten to a place of clarity for yourself, you can focus on stabilization, which I talked about in my April video. And if you think about gender not being part of the picture, if generally speaking, you had a kid who was really mentally distressed and maybe struggling with self-harm or like a disordered eating or something, what would you do? You'd probably lean in with a lot of love and compassion, but structure, structure. Um, I actually want to post this really interesting interview that I heard today about disordered eating. And this, I think she's a nutritionist or a dietitian or something, but she herself struggled with anorexia. And she was talking about like in her recovery process, how important it was for others to keep her accountable and how like because she was so sick, she couldn't make good decisions about her food. So when she was in treatment as a, she was a, like a young adult, she was like 19 or 20 or something, but her parents and at the time her husband, she got married really young. They were the ones who had to help her make decisions about food because she was sick, right? So if you had a kid who was like really not well, and you were in crisis mode and maybe you made some haphazard decisions and you're in a different place now or you're, you're moving towards stability, you need to really think about like, this is a kid that doesn't know what's best for themselves and I have to really step in and take responsibility for some of these decisions because this person is not well and I love them and I know what's best for them because they don't know right now. So I just wanted to kind of touch on that. If you found this video helpful, you'll want to join my parent membership group where you'll find a lot more depth and detail along with practical parenting advice. The link is in the video description below. Thanks for watching.